Buongiorno mondo, and welcome back to 15 with Fosca. I am so happy to have as my guest today, Lucia Ducci. Good morning, Lucia. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Hi, Fosca. Hi. So um, I really kind of don't know where to start with you, Lucia, because you have such an interesting background. You have a lot of interests. But I think what I would like to start with is your journey to the States. So tell me a little bit more about what led you to the United States and then why you decided to stay for such a long time. Thank you, Fosca. First and foremost, I'm so grateful to be here. Well, I'm so and happy you're here. <laughs> and to be one of your guests. I think um, you're doing something so special, bringing together people from different backgrounds and stories. Um, it's so important, especially nowadays, that we are all so disconnected from one another because we are so much, you know, yeah. into our digital devices. That's and right. We lost um the habit of connecting yeah. to human beings. So thank you. You're doing such a great job. Thank you for, for noticing that it's that's true. what I've been trying to do finally. It's like, okay, somebody gets it. So thank you for understanding that I'm really trying to do that in my own little way. And so I really appreciate that somebody notices. Brava, thank you. Brava. So about me, yeah. um, uh, many, many, many years ago, I, I got the chance to go on vacation uh, to the U.S. Okay. with my girlfriends. And uh, I have to say that I was a little bit critical at the time mm -hmm. of the United States. And uh, the first time I walked in New York, I felt this incredible sense of familiarity. Yeah. Um, maybe because I grew up watching American movies. I don't know. It was something pervasive. It was mm. something like I had the feeling that I've been there before and that somehow I belonged to that society. Mm. I felt really in tune with the with the mentality, with the sense of freedom, of opportunities, yeah. the enthusiasm that Sometimes we don't have here in Italy, especially, you know, um, thinking about young generations. Yeah. Um, so it was because of this uh, sense of freedom, opportunities. I love the food. I think American food is underrated. Yeah. It's actually very, very good. Mm -hmm. I love the nature. And so I decided to go back somehow to okay. the U.S., so I um, did my PhD dissertation on um, uh, the relations between the U.S. and Italy in the twenty in the first twenty years of the twentieth century. Mm -hmm. So I was at College Park, Maryland. Ah, I didn't realize you were at University of Maryland. It was just for research okay. purposes, and then from there I applied uh, to the exchange program between the University of Florence and Holy Cross. Okay. So after that I went to Holy Cross and I taught Italian, and then from Holy Cross I got a chance to teach Italian in Boston College, mm. and then from Boston College... Uh, UMass Amherst okay. for four years. Wow, that's a yeah, long time. Yeah, that was a big uh, turning point for me living in the Happy Valley. It's so me. nice there. It's yeah. sort of like, I think Western Mass, for those who don't know it, it's like this happy little island mm -hmm. where everyone's like extremely politically yeah. open. And it's just like this nice little spot in the United States that it's just wonderful. You're surrounded by colleges. It's just like a very cool place to be. So obviously you were happy there. Yes, it, that experience really forged my my personality. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to Holy Cross. Okay. And, and this brings me to 2019 when I was offered the position of um, the director of um, the Florence program. Okay. So I, I came back. Okay, so let's talk about that quickly. And then I want to go back to your experience in the mm. States. Mm -hmm. Why did you come back? So I came back for, uh, of course, many reasons. And for the first time in my life, I had a um, stable position because before I was getting contracts, you know, sometimes a year contract, sometimes two years contracts. Mm. But um, I I never knew, you know, what, what was going to happen next, right? Yeah. You didn't feel like the safety of that. Exactly. It was very exciting uh, when you're new. I mean, when you're young, yeah. you, you're open to you know so many possibilities but after a certain time it was uh, time to to get something stable so this was a reason another reason was because I've met the most important person of my life mm -hmm. and so a long distance relationship was oh, really uh, unsustainable so yeah. after a while 
and also because I could put together um, two of my passions. So working with American students for the institution um, of the Holy Cross and also uh, living in Florence and returning the favor that I you know, received when I was in the U.S. of being mm -hmm. hosted, of being fed. Of That's being, beautiful. You know, my, my friends, my colleagues there, they opened the door to me. And now it's time, you know, for to me give to, back. to give back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is what I'm trying to do, like to, to show these young students um, what is Florence from a different perspective, yeah. from, you know, a lo a more local perspective. Right, from an authentic per yeah. perspective. And just, like, can we say a few words about the Holy Cross program? Because mm -hmm. it is different from other programs. Yeah. It's small. It's very um, authentic in that the students study at University of Florence. So tell me just a bit about the program, and yes. then I want to go back to a couple of things that you said that I'm very curious to hear more about. So tell me about your students and tell me about the program. So the students uh, come to Florence after taking at least three, better four semesters of Italian. Okay. So when they are here, they are capable of interacting with people. They live in a host family and they go to the University of Florence where each of them can pursue their major, minor. They can, you know, study economics or history okay. art history we, we have a wide range of um, and classes. those classes are in Italian the classes are in Italian okay so they are wow. surrounded by Italian students and eventually they take exams in Italian that's great yeah it's very challenging for them yeah. and also because Holy Cross is a Jesuits a school yes. there's this um uh, accent on on th there's this attention on the service yeah. so when they're here all of them um work at a project that, that can be uh you know uh, a project of like misericordia okay. a charity so they do some kind of public service they have to do some kind of public exactly. service exactly that's yeah. wonderful yeah that's wonderful and uh, one of my projects for the future is to try to connect these kids to more um, NGOs or, or any group that... I have a couple would. of ideas so, for you. Awesome. We can talk about that because um, I have a few ideas. So because right. your students stay for longer... They stay... They actually... There yeah. are... You know, the hard thing is when you volunteer, associations want to know that they can count on you. And, the, and sometimes they require also like a training. Like I just yep. finished a volunteer training. Having said that, though, in my experience... People need extra hands, and so mm -hmm. we can we can brainstorm a little about that. But I have some ideas for your students, also because right. they speak Italian. Yes, and so that's already a great thing. Yeah, I want to get back to something you said okay. because you sort of touched on it now when you talked about sort of giving back. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke about um, something that I really felt connected to, which was, and I'm going to quote you here. You said the importance of finding a mentor and of implementing healthy habits. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, in so in your current role at Holy Cross, you're obviously acting as a mentor. You're mm -hmm. a mentor to these students. Yeah. But I want to talk a little more about those mentors that you found in the United States and those people who you mentioned who sort of took you under their wing, yeah. who guided you, whether that be academically or personally, personally. or professionally, yeah. maybe all three. Yeah. And I'm very, I think, our roles, well, I'm not really a study abroad educator anymore. We were just talking about this, but something that I feel very strongly about is mentorage, is mentorship. Yeah. And I, I feel that if it's not present in our lives, we don't have that sort of that guidance that we need, that person that we can turn to. So tell me a little more oh, about yeah, this, this I, relationship I, you have with the notions of mentoring and, yeah. and being mentored. Yeah, I uh, first let me start by saying that our um, rhythm of life is so fast nowadays that uh, to find a good mentor is key because it actually allows you to save time. To find someone who has been there before you and can spare some mistakes mm -hmm. is, re is really important. Um, I had 
um, mentor, like I consider my mentors some of my colleagues, some of the professors who share their knowledge with Absolutely. me. Uh, I had coaches, I had, I, I still have the therapist. I, I need someone to talk to who is able to assess my progress and someone who doesn't have any, you know, emotional involvement with me. Yeah. Someone who can clearly say, exactly. you know, things as they are. Mm-hmm. And this is important also for younger, you know, generations. It's vital. It's vital. Yeah. Nowadays we are misled probably by social media and these kids find leaders or or influencer, you know, their their mentors, but but this is completely it's wrong. Very superficial. You know? Yeah. So it is important to find the right mentor you don't even have to tell someone oh you are my mentor but you have to observe and learn and you Fosca are a mentor (laughs) I I mean I I let I feel comfortable in that role Mm -hmm. but I'm also a mentee yeah and it goes it goes both ways and I think it's also a part of like how you approach life I think that if you approach it with an openness Mm -hmm. and also to not be afraid of somebody coming in it's not really criticizing, but saying like, have you thought about doing it this way? Yeah. Or why aren't you, you know, approaching this problem thinking about it this way? So sometimes it's also just a question of somebody giving you the tools to see your path in a different way. Yes. So how are you doing that with the students now? You're paying it forward, if you will. Mm-hmm. You're taking these students under your wing. Mm-hmm. You're mentoring them. You're Italianizing them. I try to. You try to. <laughs> so tell me about what it's like to be running a, a small, but still running a study abroad program in 2023 with the world going as rapidly as yeah. going with all as as it's going and with all of this interference. Yes. How can you keep the students sort of focused? Yeah, it's more and more complicated. Yeah. But I strongly believe in personal connection. So I really invest on my you know, personal connection to yeah. the students. I like to talk to them yeah. one-on-one yeah. when it's possible. I like to listen to them because this you know, these kids needs to be they need to be listened to, to yeah. carefully. Yeah. Um and um and and I don't know, I try to learn from them. That's yeah, if I'm I'm quite honest here. I learn from each of them every semester. And so it, you know, that that's the process. And it's and I, I feel the same way obviously and I felt the same way in the past. I think that we have a lot to learn from young people and oh my God. and it teaches us a lot about ourselves yeah. and it also kind of keeps you kind of like up to speed yeah. with what's going on in the world oh, and absolutely. you know with technology and things like that like you have to if you work with young people yeah. you can never like rest on your laurels uh-huh. you just have to keep evolving and keep moving and that's why it's I think so exciting to work with young people yes I agree okay. I agree also going back to you know the importance of a mentor I think that um, you never know who's going to change your life, who's going to have an impact, an important impact on your life. Um, it's, I also think that it's so important to live abroad to, I, to you know, yeah. a certain extent that would make mandatory for any um, I agree. human being. I agree. Because uh, when you live abroad, you really have to tap on your own uh, resources. Yeah. You have to tr- learn to trust yourself. Yeah. And sometimes uh, learning other ways of life, other ways of, you know, um, of uh, spending <laughs> the, the the time, yeah. um, it is it is so fundamental, and I strongly believe that if people um, would have done more studying abroad, working abroad, living abroad, there would be less wars. I agree, Lucia. conflicts in the world, 100%. especially for young me, uh, young, young women. Yeah. Mm. you know. You spoke about, see, this is something that I'm really interested in that we hadn't talked about before, but you wrote it down for me when I sort of asked you to give me your bio and a couple of points of discussion. And again, I want to quote you because you made a really interesting statement. You look at the brain drain as something positive, Mm -hmm. which, you know, it's funny because I'm like, oh, Lucia, you came back. And so the reverse brain drain, I'm all excited about the reverse brain drain. 
but I had never looked at it positively until you said something which really impacted me. So you said, um, you, you cite the importance of deliberately living abroad yeah. for personal and professional growth and view the brain drain as an opportunity for women who want to live their lives fully. And that is a really bold and empowering statement. So I want to hear more about that. Yeah. Was it that for you? I think so. Yeah. Yes, I, I strongly believe it was. Because uh, when you when you move abroad, you start fresh. So you ha- it's like a, you, you're birth again. You yeah. You birth yourself. Yeah. And you have to provide yourself, mm-hmm. you know, support, friends, uh, network. Um, you, you have to really take care of yourself. You have to yourself. hustle. Right. You have to hustle yeah. and you have to do things. If not, it's not like everything's, well, although the U.S. system is easier. I mean, things do get, it's easier, like, you know. No? I well, maybe for me it is because sure. it's mine. Mm-hmm. So, But mm-hmm. I see like the university system compared, I just spoke about this in a recent podcast, but like the way the university is set up here and the way our you know, private colleges, yeah. our public colleges are yeah. set up. Yeah. It's like... Yes, of course, but you also have the practical aspects of your life. Yeah. And especially if you live in Western Massachusetts without a car. Well, I wanted to ask you, so what was hard uh, for you? It was it was hard from the practical standpoint. Right. Because of the, because of the weather, because I didn't it's have a cold. car. Because I... No. You know, the first time I, I rented a place five miles away from, from you know, UMass. Yeah. And I had to ride a bike to, mm. to get to work. And uh, But anyway, all these things... I really, um, I'm really thankful for because uh, they, they really helped me to to become who I am. Yeah. And so um, all these practical or academic challenges that we might encounter or have encountered are really um, important steps that yeah. uh, they'll help me or help anybody who you know who's on this path right. to to. To grow exactly and, and and to progress you know yeah. personally academic and and this is uh the most important thing right Pro- progress to progress that you are progressing right and that you're evolving and i think that evolving. that's i think that that's something that comes out very clearly um in your biography and also in our conversations and i want to talk a little bit about your research um because you have You've done very interesting research, but you've also recently discovered somebody who has a connection to Florence, who is a very interesting figure. And I'd like for you to speak a little bit about her. For our listeners, I didn't know her. Yeah. Um, I didn't know her at all. I was surprised when you you mentioned her story to me. Um, I'll let you talk about her because I think she was in many ways a pioneer, Mm -hmm. and I don't understand why more people don't know about her. And so, or maybe they do, and it's just me not knowing. No, no. No? No. So tell me who who this person is and yeah. what intrigued you about her and what you'd like to do. Yeah, so this person is uh, Sarah Parker Raymond. And I found this name while I was um, preparing a footnote for another, um, uh, for an article about another feminist that hmm. uh, should come out these days okay and so i'm always being intrigued by uh feminist yeah. of course yeah. um and um so the the fascinating part is that sarah parker raymond was um an activist and uh, abolitionist uh, afro-descendant mm-hmm. from uh, massachusetts mm-hmm. and i'm talking about the 19th century right uh, at a very young age, she started to champion women's rights and the right for women to vote and to get an education and so in general social justice. Mm-hmm. And she was very, you know, very determined on, on that. Yeah. And um, she moved to London mm-hmm. to to get an education to to study, and she kept, you know, championing her. Um, desire to see you know these rights yes. implemented mm-hmm. and um, in uh, London she connected to Mazzini okay. Giuseppe Mazzini and uh, it was Giuseppe Mazzini who wrote her letter of recommendation for uh, the hospital in Florence and uh, Florence at the time was um, an excellence for research mm-hmm. and medical practice 
So she arrived in Florence. Uh, we are at uh, mid, um, uh, actually in 1867. So wow. Florence was the capital of right. Italy. Oh, how interesting. I didn't realize that she was here at that time. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So, so right after the unification of Italy. Exactly. And right after the Civil right War. Right after the Civil War. Right? I mean, this woman was amazing. Yeah. Exactly. I and agree. so she studied medicine here. She studied medicine. Can you imagine not only the first woman, but uh, all the prejudice and, yeah. and the difficulties that she must, she must have, have encountered. encountered? So what kind of, I mean, what records are there? Like you've you found this person. So, yes, there uh, she wrote her own autobiography, uh-huh. which is uh, very interesting. Okay. And also there is, a, I mean, before me, there is an historian who I love. Mm-hmm. So Pasolenius wrote books and articles about Sarah Parker Raymond and um, about the cosmopolitanism of Florence. And I did some research. I found uh, some documents in the archive of the hospital. And uh, it was very, I would say, almost shocking to read that she was called the La Negra d'America. Yeah, Uh, that was her, the the way she was referred to. Uh, But anyway, after two years, she managed to graduate um, and she became an obstetrician. So it... I think it was revolutionary yeah. for a woman with such a background um, to get a degree in a male-dominated In a foreign field, country, in, in a, a male-dominated country, field. At that point in time. speaking Italian. An, it was a doctor. I mean, it's pretty unbelievable. Very, very inspirational, mm-hmm. I think. So one thing is, you know, the historical research, which yeah. I think it's very um, important, uh, also, going back to healthy habits, implementing healthy habits, I think it's so important to read and to write yeah. and to study. Mm-hmm. It's really therapeutical. But on the other hand, I still think that uh, we need model. We need positive um, figure. And I think Sarah Parker Raymond is one of those, even if, you know, um, we, we have to go back to the 19th century. But her message is still mm-hmm. so, so, so. Uh, important and I would like to quote uh, yes her please do I would love because that because I think that this um, this passage that she delivered in London in 19, in 1859 uh, really really speaks to me and she said uh, I appeal on behalf of 4 million men women and children who are chattels in the southern states of America we are two years before the outburst of the American Civil War. Mm. Not because they are identical with my race and color, though I'm proud of that identity, but because they are men and women. And this is something that we should always remind ourselves about. It's so about. current. It's so current, right? right? If we think about, you know, uh, all the conflicts going on right now, and we should remind ourselves that even we are just men and women with all our insecurities, with all our all problems, our faults, our all faults. our yeah, and uh, and violence is always a failure in you know any given context. Yeah. Um, so I think Sarah Parker Raymond is a very inspirational figure, and we should dedicate yeah, more more space more to her space story. To her, did yeah. she practice? So she practiced medicine in Italy. Did mm-hmm. she stay here and yeah, eventually until, die? I mean, exactly. she really until the end of her days. She didn't go back to the U.S. She married an Italian. Uh-huh. Guy. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then like they, all of us do. <laughs> like all of us American women do. Yes, yeah. Yeah. In that sense. She was the fall. she was the, yeah. you know, original. But yeah. um yeah, yeah, and so yeah. where she is she in Rome? In Rome. So yeah. she's she's buried, buried in Rome. There. Yeah. Have you been? No, not yet. I mean I've been to the um, um Protestant uh cemetery, cemetery, but not to visit her grave. And exactly. Do you want to go? Yeah, we let's love go to. make a, pi- a pilgrimage. No, oh, really, yeah. I, I need that to go to Rome fantastic. in the new year. Let's just go. That would be great. We can take the train down and we'll go and we'll visit her. We'll have some cacio e pepe and take the train back up. It's right. per- perfecto. Deal. Deal. <laughs> it's deal. a deal. <laughs> Thank you once again for tuning in to this week's episode of 15 with Vasca and for continuing to do so. Grazie mille e alla prossima volta.